Hi, I'm Tally Mahoney, and welcome to The Good Room, where we have interdisciplinary conversations about what makes a room good. And today we're talking about a good dorm room with Morgan Naven, who has worked on a wide range of campus buildings and is a former resident assistant, and Daryl Long, a hospitality design director at Page. So we're chatting about how hotel rooms and dorm rooms can inform and intersect each other. Morgan, could you tell us a bit about the quad design at the University of Houston? It is a 1,200 bed residence hall. It was an existing beloved building on campus. We kept the intent behind all the buildings that used to be there. And we built these beautiful courtyards around existing mature trees. And so there's plenty of indoor spaces for students to enjoy and hang out with. But there's all these kind of programmed quads, courtyards. That's how it got its name, the quad. There's four of them for students to come out and enjoy. And they still enjoy it. And I stock it on social media and see students posting on it all the time. And it's just a very rewarding project to look back on. Yeah, it looks like a great design. The rooms are set up so it's more apartment style than double rooms. Am I correct about that? Correct. So just like every campus, housing really works to look for very, very diverse room opportunities for students. So this building specifically was for a multitude of different students. Some freshmen can move into it, but it was also built for upperclassmen to enjoy as well. And so the main room component is a four bedroom unit with a living room and a little kitchenette quote-unquote private bathroom. So all four people use a single shower bathroom setup, but you can close and lock those doors. And each bedroom is its own bedroom. There are seven buildings under the quad. Six of them had the room type I just described, and one building was set up more townhome style. And so this is meant for live and learn groups or international groups to come in and live. First floor is basically one giant living room and kitchenette. And it's full kitchen. You've got two stovetops, two full fridges, beautiful steps leading up to it, even a little patio on the front and back. Like it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. When you walk in, you have an open staircase that goes up the next two levels. But there are 18 beds in there. And so it's a little different. So you've got two on the first floor, On level two and three, it's eight. And so those eight bedrooms are all, once again, single unit bedrooms. So you've got your bed in there, your closet. Then the bathrooms are, once again, a little bit more of that shared style. But each shower is a closed door that you can get behind each toilet. It's obviously a closed door that you get behind. And it's just really the sinks that are open and shared. So it's a different unit, but it's meant to build that learning group. Or if you're an international student, you're sharing with all your peers that you're used to. Wow, it sounds a lot like it's designing for that privacy, but also having the common spaces to have that social interaction. And maybe that's a piece of also the hotel design that obviously it's encouraging a little bit more privacy, but there are those kind of common spaces. Well, there used to be, I guess about 10 years ago, there was a movement in hotel room design where the bathrooms were completely open to the guest rooms and, you know, the the bathtub was visible. There were no demising walls. There wasn't any curtains. And and I think it just over time, you know, you're looking at it going, you know, I do want a certain degree of privacy. If I'm in the room by myself, I really don't care. But if I'm there with a guest or something, you you seem like you would be. So that kind of went by the wayside where the the bathroom that itself would still be kind of open, but then we started introducing glass. Then we started introducing, you know, glass that would change colors. And then you started introducing impregnated glass with the, with the curtain or, or different ways to screen it off to still maintain a certain degree of privacy. Cause you gotta realize a hotel room nowadays is somewhere around 365 square feet, which isn't a great deal of space. If you imagine all the components go in it and a bathroom has to go in it. So the more we can open it up, it gives the illusion that the space is bigger, but The idea of privacy is always a question. In housing, it's such an interesting balance of it's less privacy and more geared towards what helps a student find independence. Something that housing is very cognizant of is ensuring students are getting out of their rooms and making those connections, whether it be with faculty and professors and staff at the university, or quite honestly, what their like number one component is, is making friends. You are more likely to succeed and continue and complete your degree if you have that connection. And generally, that connection is generated through living on campus your freshman year. And so that's why they really emphasize that. And so privacy is always that balance of 
there needs to be safe spaces. There needs to be a space for a student to go to and just have that if they're going through some type of emotion, be able to, you know, collect themselves and feel that in whatever way they need to, but also just have those fun run-ins. And I think there's a there's a synonymous design nature with, with hotel rooms in, I guess, the 80s. A guy named Ian Schrager was the owner with Philippe Stark and designed this first wave of what we now call boutique hotels. But the rooms were very small. I mean, they were tiny. They were probably 280 square feet max, including the bathroom. It had a vibrant lobby, had a vibrant food and beverage. I mean, everything about anything was happening in the public spaces. And his basic philosophy was the room is small because you shouldn't be staying in your room. Get up, wash your face, get out on the street. Yes. And I will say I love exploration of different room types. We are constantly exploring what is a room type on a campus? What does that mean? What do you need? What is the goal behind your room type? And sometimes, unfortunately, it comes down to what can we afford for, you know, some of these campuses we work on are so land restricted and so tight. And we are filling in that last open spot and sometimes having to, you know, repurpose even an existing building to get it there. And so sometimes it's that. And sometimes we have amazing projects where it's let's explore what the student experience is. So there's always this what's in the because we use the term unit. What is in that unit? How many beds? What are those beds configured as? And what are the amenities within the unit versus what amenities are out on the floor. So I mentioned the quad has the kitchenette. We use the term kitchenette to generally imply that there is not a fire element (laughs) in the room, which is always a slight concern with students. But on every floor, we have actually full kitchens, two stovetops, two giant refrigerators. So if you're wanting to go make your meal, you can go do that. And if you want to bring someone back for a date, there's the opportunity to go do that. And there are these lovely day lit open spaces and people can go study in it. We have different seating types in the area for people to enjoy. So it's anything that's not in that quote unquote unit then becomes part of those common spaces that are spread throughout the building. So I think it's interesting how much we align with hotels, but I think hotels do generally have the ability to put a little bit more in their units than we do. We try to uh, go on the safety side, I think, a little bit more in regards to the students. You never know who's coming in knowing how to turn on a stovetop versus who might not. You know, I, I, I look at a guest room design, which can be simple or can be complex because equate a guest room or equate design in general to music. If there's a if there's a one to one equation to it, you know, there's only 12 notes in a musical scale. And what Wagner or Paul McCartney does with those 12 notes is a heck of a lot different than what I do with 12 notes and a, and a heck of a lot more brilliant. If you think of design that way, that you're you have this box of only limited amount of things. It's what you do with them that separates us from other people and other designers. And I think that's the key. I I'm of the opinion that I think guest room should be a little bit more scaled down. A guest room needs a bed, a good bathroom, and a television. Those are the three main components of, as much as I don't agree with the television, it's needed. Those are, if you look at it, those are the three things that you need. There's a reason why history repeats itself. There's a reason why there's des- designs that we can look back in time and go, that really worked, or that made sense. You know, maybe we shouldn't mess with that. Maybe we can evolve it and make it ours. But reinventing it sometimes doesn't make it doesn't do us any good. I totally agree with that. We almost work from the opposite spectrum of the rooms have to be so basic just to support the students. And there's a lot of things we can do to add that flair and that support. But really, it's not our space to decorate. It's the student's home that's going to come in and create it. So it's that balance between how can we keep it simple, but how can we still hit all those amazing metrics students want and are interested in? Well, keeping it affordable, too, because obviously the more trendy, the cooler, the whatever it is, money starts to go up and it still needs to be affordable for students to come live on campus. And depending on what part of the country you're in, the existence of it on campus makes it cheap. Sometimes it's a lot more affordable off campus than on. So it's how do you get them on and keep it affordable, but also not have it be four walls in a bed, you know, get get some amazing daylight, have amazing amenities, just have unique opportunities that aren't just how close are you to your classes so you can sleep that extra 30 minutes, which sometimes is all they need. And you also, you know, we talk about mood. I think, you know, we're just starting to touch on that subject, but everything that we do has to have a mood. 
you want an emotional connection to where you lay your head. You know, you, if you lay your head in the dark and you rise in the light, Morgan, you had said it, there, there is, there is something it's healthy. It's something it's well being. So the, the better we design it and try to curate those emotions to somebody feeling better about their life, their, their themselves, everything around them, it does help and it does make us better designers and produce a better product. Yeah. And, and I think it's, we have to be so sensitive to the nuances of the mood of what you were describing. I mean, that can come down to as silly as it sounds to some people, to the pink color you choose, to the furnishing colors you choose. Some you walk in and you're like, this was in the nineties. And you're like, no, this is a brand new building. And so it really has to, we have to be so careful about acknowledging what each element we bring into the room evokes out of people. And we don't want people to walk into a space and be like, oh, this is so dated. I'm reading right now the book Architecture of Happiness. It's talking about exactly what you were saying, where an object can just people will perceive it in such a different way and everybody sees beauty differently and it makes them feel something. But you could look at a straight line versus a jagged line and you'd say that straight line is a little more calm. And it's just fascinating that you are now talking a similar sense of how those objects can really lead to happiness or well-being. It's, it's interesting that, you know, the, the idea of designing happiness or designing something that evokes a sense of goodwill I think if you almost even distill that even down to the point where you're designing something that has an emotional connection, and sometimes that emotional connection could be happiness, it could be somber, it could be content. You know, there's a lot of different words we can use other than happiness. I mean, happiness to me could be a yellow wall. God forbid you paint a guest room with a yellow wall, you know? So it's, it's, it's to me, it, it's probably more geared to the emotional response because in a hotel, probably very similar to the resonance is you're walking through a journey of experiences. So we designed the opportunity for people to have experience. And that's probably the best way we can curate all of these circle lines and squares. So by the, by the time somebody walks in a hotel, we need to be able to provide them with the opportunity that they're looking at these different moods and emotions and they're feeling these different moods of emotions and senses, you know, sensory. So they're, they're smelling something from the restaurant. They're seeing something from the bar. When they get in the elevator, it's clean and it sets a mood. It's the transition from a lobby that could be dark to a guest room floor that could be light or vice versa. You know, there's these transition points that which most people don't know is we kind of subliminally kind of curate what they're feeling or what they're they're going through. These buildings, especially on a university campus, go through so much of someone's life that happens. I mean, we're capturing potentially some of the most pivotal moments of someone's life. And they're going through whole slews of emotions of there's, unfortunately, you know, people go through depressive episodes and there are things that come with that. And how do we create safe spaces that can let support staff that live in the residence halls witness something that they can step in and help support them on. You know, there's the dark side of it. There's the joyous moments of getting the first A on their first test on campus or getting an honors award or you name it or making a friend and realizing that friend's going to be in your life for forever. You know, there's just all these momentous moments happening. And yes, they're in our building and yes, they're around our building. And yes, you know, there's parts of it, but some of that's way bigger than just the walls that we've built. And so it's a little bit of the humbling of stepping back and going, there's only so much you can do by nature of working on these projects. In many ways, a residence hall, a campus is bringing more to the project than we can. And we're just there to support it. We can do stuff to boost it and to help it and, you know, work with that campus to really upgrade some of those experiences as much as we can. But I know anybody listening to this has probably been in the oldest building on a campus and still made an amazing memory in it. And so that's that's the humbling part that we have to remember. And so it's always that balance between putting that much passion into it, but also stepping back and recognizing what this is for. And that's what helps keep you passionate is you just want to be part of the story. You want to help encourage the stories that are happening in people's lives. But, you know, great design is just a culmination of a million small details. 
And mm-hmm. it takes all of those small details to really make a great space. And a lot of them, like you really don't see or notice, but those coupled with everything else around it, the adjacencies and everything, even the small details of molding make or break a room. So, I mean, I think that's pretty neat. I think it's also, I love what you were just saying, because the one thing that we share as well is I remember good, good and bad in college. You know, I rem- we all have memories of school. A lot of those four years or six years that you spend, you know, kind of mold you into the adult that you become. Hotels are the same way. You know, you have weddings in hotels, you have, you know, successful business meetings, you have, you have all of these things that surround these areas outside of your home that, that truly can make a difference in your life and mold you to the person that you are or seem to become. So it's, it's pretty neat to be part of that. There's not many, many things in life that I think we design that actually we have that much, uh, that much influence. It's, it's one of the more rewarding sides of architecture. I do have a question for you because you mentioned you have to still design for weddings and those kinds of things. How do you design for that and then the everyday experience? Because we have a similar thing on residence halls with move-in day. Once again, that one day, yeah. that one event, and then we have summer camps. So, but that's not the, that's the one-off. Those are the big components of what we do. But so how are you designing for those oddball one-off things, but still designing for the everyday? Does it impact the design and there's a balance or is it separate? Well, it, 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 uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a series of both. Typically, if there's a wedding, then outside venue or an inside venue. And very similar to what you have to do, you have to deal with parking. That's, that's the main idea. And that's the main component. When you, if you're the architect designing the building, you've got a grid based off of parking, which is based off the bay size of the guest room, which is based off how we can span the ballroom. You know, all of those things are, you know, just like anything else, kind of, kind of start with the structure and obviously parking. So your thing is everybody's going into the building. What we try to do in the event space is take them away from the building so that there's secondary entrances. So you have the golden moment of a hotel design is the lobby and the guest room and the, and the restaurant. So if we're looking at the entry sequence as being the primary first impression, then we can't have a million people going through that. We can't have in resort areas, we can't have buses dropping off people there. We have to be able to move that to a secondary location to make to preserve that entry sequence. So it's just basically bifurcating the two the two programs. Oh, interesting. I think on our campus, it's it's generally that balance, too, of that entry sequence. But recognizing students don't always use the entry sequence you think they're going to use oh, of course. Yeah. on a day to day. I think a lot of our residence halls, there's a lot of reasons for this, but there's, you know, the check-in desk and that's our main entry sequence. And that's the, if the tour is coming through, there's generally a relatively large lobby. That's the largest lounge on the quad. It was also some multi-purpose rooms that was semi-event space. There's pool tables. There's, you know, just like really cool stuff, big glowing box of, you know, glass and light and just cool architecture right there. I would venture to say that maybe in my happiest of thoughts, 25% of the students enter the building at that point. And so it's for us, it's always that balance of, okay, ideally, we'd like this. But we also know students are going to take the absolute shortest path possible. I think that if you if we take our hats off, our designer architect hats off and go, okay, if I was a guest, would this really work? Would it function the way I think it's supposed to function? Because it might look great on paper, might look great on plan, might look great in a model and great in a rendering. But when it comes to actually walking the space, you realize oh, that's about 30 steps too far. There's a, there's, there's a fascinating side of it. And particularly me with being interior focused, you know, we typically get a building that's somewhat flushed at that point. Corn shell is set. So it's not like we can go in and go, OK, you know, that core needs to move 10 feet that way. But, you know, the, the geometry and the math dictates that this desk or this sequence has to go here. So there, there, there's a bit of challenge. If we're, like I said, if we're not involved in the corn shell, it gets a little bit more challenging. Ours is a lot of times derived straight from the unit type because those are going to stack 
those are going to rule everything. Even structure is going to have to bend its will to that. And that's always our driving force. And generally, our entry sequence is the one thing that's typically allowed to break it. <laughs> and so we get to play a bit more with that until you remember. And it varies on campus. Almost all of them have some type of moving component. And this always comes in with the doors and your hallway width. And they have these carts of different types. In Texas, it's generally these like barrel looking cart things for people to just chunk stuff in and push up and down the elevator. So that dictates your elevator size. That dictates you need two of them to cross paths in a corridor. So at some point in the corridor, generally at hopefully the doors, the corridor is at least a minimal widening to allow two carts to kind of get past each other. It's that oddball detail that we have to remember to conform to that's only there two days of the year. (laughs) While we're nearing the end of this conversation, do you think there's any way that the residence hall could be informed by the design that we've been talking about with the hotel? Absolutely. I think hotels do an amazing job of creating the feeling of more space than there actually is in a room. And I think that's something we definitely can learn from, especially as the potential trend of creating singular rooms or more of that apartment studio suite becomes more popular. Whether or not campuses continue to do so, we'll see. But just really finding a way to create the feeling of more space without actually using more square footage is something we can learn from our fellow peers and the hotel multifamily group. Hotels today, there are hotel brands that are looking at almost a dorm style where there's a connecting room there were two rooms connected by a bathroom or that there's four rooms and a one bathroom on the floor. I can definitely see a market for it. You know, it's not really a hostel and it's not really a dorm, but, you know, it still has a, a certain degree of, of a, a luxury level to it. For me, both hotel rooms and dorm rooms kind of caress it, but that's always where I would go back at the end of the day and the day would feel so chaotic whenever I was in either of those environments. And so just being in that room where I felt safe and secure and comfortable was so impactful for me. So it'd be cool to see how these rooms could eventually converge a little bit to just help that design and help the user feel a little safer. Well, thank you, Morgan and Daryl. This was so much fun. And thank you to everybody who's listening. How did I stay up?